to see you all here. We've had a great summer weather, and now we have some long-awaited rain. Nothing to complain about today. We pray that this will be a great service, and we especially welcome all those here, but also um, the people who are watching online on our live streaming. And we pray that uh, you will also be blessed in your home. Uh, we're very lucky here that um, we have Pastor Casey and his wife Liz and some of the family members here with us in a very informal way. They just moved up uh, this past week and, and they're just getting their bearings. So uh, if you want to say hi after, you can. Um, we also um, welcome Nick Coopery, uh, who will do our sermon today and, and he will preach on shipwrecking, I understand. But uh, I see he brought a huge rope, so I think it's going to be all okay at the end. <laughs> and that's what the Bible tells us. All right, we go for our opening song. of the privileges we enjoy as your people to come, come to you in these moments to confess our sins to, to receive, receive forgiveness, forgiveness and give it to pray and sing and listen to renew our fainting spirits to rest in all your promises open our eyes to see you O Lord open our ears to hear your word visit us through your Holy Spirit Help us to celebrate our faith. Amen. Amen. Good morning, uh, Guelph Church. It's uh, 
It's great to be back. I, uh, I really like this church. I've sort of been coming here since my days back in Young People's Youth Group now, I guess. So it's always got a special place in my heart, this church does. It really does. And it's, it's, uh, I really enjoy coming here to preach. I know many of you, and I know many of you know me, and it's always good to fellowship after church. But we've come here to worship our Father, our Father in heaven. And as we come to him, let's first come to him in a moment of prayer. Father God, there truly is no God as great as you. From the immensity of the cosmos you have created, and it speaks of your incredible power, all the way to the smallest intricacies of the strands of DNA that make up all living organisms. Father God, you created it all for everyone to see. And yet, so many say there is no God. And Lord, you further reveal yourself through your words in scripture to reveal your gracious nature, your nature as a loving father who loves us more than anything else in all of creation. For all who confess your name, Lord, you gave us the gift of the Holy Spirit. And this morning, Lord, we pray that the Holy Spirit will move this church, that it will make this church, the Water Street Church here, become the irresistible church, and that it will be led by your Spirit. And we pray all this in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And we are here for this worship celebration. And we heard our call to worship. God calls us to worship. And we've all responded. We've all come here. Whether you're here in person or you're joining us online. But God is the perfect host. And as a perfect host, he greets us. And he greets us with these words this morning. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And now we'll respond in song forever.
Gracious God, our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. Forgive what our lips tremble to name, and what our hearts can no longer bear, and what has become for us a consuming fire of judgment. Set us free from a past that we cannot change. Open to us a future in which we can be changed, and grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image. Through Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Amen. Now hear these words from 1 Timothy 1.15 and 1 Peter 2.24. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds we have, we have been healed. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> well, we thought there was a children's moment, but we're going to go right into a children's song instead. We're going to sing the B I B L E. to the time in the service where we're going to come together um, as a community, both uh, online and here in person, um, as a communal prayer. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. Sorry, there is another time, and that is the time for kids who are ages three and four to head on with their teacher to church school. So I'll just leave a moment for that as everybody gets their act together to leave. All right, <laughs> that was fast. <laughs> so, but um, I just thought, I don't know if it's been done recently, but I'm going to ask if there are any prayer concerns this morning that somebody would like to bring forward and that will be included in the prayer today. So um, I'll just leave a moment for some, anybody to, if they want to speak up. The war in Ukraine. The war in Ukraine. Another oh, and um, 
did you want to say something, Jack, or do you want me to pray for what I think you want me to pray for? Okay. You'll hear about it in the prayer. <laughs> And did you say Eileen? Yeah, and that's Eileen. Eileen Sparks. Eileen, what was, do you want me to say her last name? Or? It's small name. Okay, uh, I'm sorry I can't hear that, but Karen, Karen um, has asked for prayer for Eileen and her family. She is an aunt to Karen and great aunt to the proper kids, I guess, um, who has been uh, struggling with Alzheimer's and it's progressing. Was there anything else? <laughs> yes, Marie. Can you uh, pray for the students that might be coming to Guelph and those uh, in our community that are going off that to Guelph? Going. Yes. Big, big change in life. Yep. <clears throat> anything else? Okay. Well, let's um, fold our hands, as our teachers used to say at school, or at, our parents used to say at home, <coughs> pardon me, or still do, and uh, come to our Heavenly Father in prayer. <coughs> our dear Lord in heaven, um, we come to you, uh, we have already heard through music and through Nick's words, how awesome and incredible you are and how um, we are praying for your Holy Spirit to move through our church to become a, an irresistible church. We are a community, Lord, and we are so thankful for this community. In Acts 1 verse 8, as Marguerite pointed out, it says, but we will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on us and we sh will be your witnesses to the ends of the earth. Lord, thank you for the strength that, it are, that is in those words and Lord, help us to rest in your care in all things. We thank you for the care that you take in creating so many different things in our world. We thank you for the beautiful um, creation that we can see all around us in our own neighborhoods and also if we have been lucky enough to um, to see different parts of uh, the province or the country this year or even beyond that we thank you for that we thank you for the creation of new life and we we give thanks for the miracle of new life that we see in uh, so many ways <clears throat> Pardon me. Lord, um, we, we want to pray for our country, for the decisions that are being made on a daily basis, and we pray for all of our levels of government. We think of our local uh, municipal uh, government that is going to be elected and people that are preparing at this time. Um, and we hear sometimes that there is a lack of people there is a lack of people that are willing to step up and live and um, serve and be part of democracy. Lord, you've given that form of government to us as a country. We don't live under any regime. And Lord, we just pray that you will place um, different people um, to be equipped to do those jobs. Lord, uh, in our own churches and in our own church in particular, um, we are thankful for those that have come forward to uh, plan and um, be they show up for things like cadets and gems and church school. And Lord, I just pray that you will also be with um, the youth and uh, the young adults and what, uh, what, what will be happening with them this year. Um, and also as there's different community initiatives that are in the works to invite um, for church school and also the other um, 
the other things that go on, we just pray that you will um, give wise decisions and, and um, that your hand will be also evident in that. And Lord, we pray for those and we thank um, you for all of the different people in our congregation that serve in so many different ways. And a lot of them are serving um, unbeknownst to a lot of our members. And um, we just thank you for those that just kind of take the initiative and do things. But we also pray that you will be with those that may be getting a nudge to help in a more formal way in, in terms of even um, putting themselves out there for a ministry that is kind of beyond their comfort zone, but you are speaking to them. We pray that um, as time goes on that people that are serving don't experience burnout because that is a very real thing and it can lead to a lot of dissatisfaction and a lot of um, um, things that happen that are negative and we just uh, pray that as we are uh, embarking on a new season we are so thankful that COVID is uh, the restrictions are lifting somewhat and that we are able to do these things lord um i i also want to thank you that um that for some joys that have been happening we thank you that peter and margaret kingma could celebrate their 50th wedding anniversary recently and uh we thank you for all that they are in our congregation and we we thank you for the witness that they are with their marriage of 50 years and lord we also rejoice with people that have been grieving um, that have new life uh, that have uh, that has happened with willie benaman and nelly parish in the birth of their great-grandson grayson that um, they may rejoice in this in this new hope that they see in this new little life. We also mourn again with the Vrizima family. Joshua's grandfather passed away, Clarence Decker. We pray that you will comfort him and his family. And then we want to bring forward to you too um, different um, prayer requests from today. Um, Pretty soon, actually, I see all the cars on Cedar Street, so it looks like a lot of students have moved in there. And th we pray for any students that may be coming to our church here, or that we can encourage to come to our church, or that will be led to come. Um, and we pray that you will um, be with them as they prepare and have this big change in their life. And also, Lord, as students will be heading off from our own church to university or other um, post uh, high school studies. Lord, the war in Ukraine is such a concern yet. There is, um, you hear of all these different things in this past week. There was um, a lot of uh, things that happened near the um, nuclear reactors again. Um, Lord, we just pray that there will be peace uh, struck, that people will come together and, and put down their weapons. And Lord, we thank you for different efforts that are happening here. Um, Jack uh, Rinchima, who is here to uh, play music this morning, shared with me before church that tomorrow they are getting five Ukrainian people that um, coming to their house, to live in an apartment that they have in their house um, and that they will be, some of them will be working for a company in Hamilton. These are people that just came with their suitcases, the clothes on their backs, basically. And um, this is kind of a, a thing that got organized almost in the dark, dark of night. And there's a lot of um, preparations that have to be done and a lot of prayer that has to happen that this situation will be safe. Um, and Lord, um, we thank you that they are so willing to offer. And those are the good stories we hear from this terrible war in Ukraine. Lord, Alzheimer's is a very real, um, terrible uh, thing that's happening to so many people that we hear about. And we think especially of Eileen, Karen's aunt, who uh, has suddenly deteriorated um, and Lord, uh, now changes have to be made 
in her life and the rest of it you know, is a family uh, illness um, and it is very painful. And Lord, I just pray that you will surround that family with what they need in this time. And we also continue to pray for our uh, people in our own midst who are um, not able to be with us. We think of Jean Reinders and Harry and Betty Snip. And, you know, there are, there are also others that are not here um, because they are just too weak and too tired and not well. But you are, you are with them, Lord, and we thank you for that and help us to be a support to them. Forgive them any sins that we commit. Help us to live according to your holy will. In Jesus' name, amen. The message this morning is called Shipwrecked. And it is about Paul's journey from Caesarea to Rome and how he endured a shipwreck. The story about the shipwreck is fairly long and I think most of you are probably somewhat <coughs> familiar with it. So I've just taken a piece out of it. And I will read that, but before we do that, I will just ask for God's blessing. Father God, we come to you, Lord, and we just pray that your spirit will be here. Lord, I pray that your spirit will lead me in the words I say and give me clarity of voice and clarity of mind. And I pray for open minds and hearts to hear and live out the words that they hear. We pray it in your name. Amen. So I'll be reading from Acts 7, or Acts 27, verse 13 to 26. But the words back there are a whole lot bigger than they are in this Bible, so I will put this away, and I'll read it from there. When a gentle south wind began to blow, they saw their opportunity, so they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. Before very long, a wind of hurricane force called the Nor'easter swept down from the island. The ship was caught by the storm and could not head into the wind, so we gave way to it and were driven along. As we passed to the lee of a small island called Kauda, we were hardly able to make the lifeboat secure. So the men hoisted it aboard. Then they passed ropes under the ship itself to hold it together because they were afraid they would run aground on the sandbars of Sirtis. So they lowered the sea anchor and let the ship be driven along. We took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. After they had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourselves this damage and loss. But now I urge you to keep up your courage, because not one of you will be lost, only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me. And he said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar, and God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up the courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. When I preach, I always use a lot of stories, metaphors. I always have objects. I bring objects with to illustrate my point because when I'm sitting where you are and someone else is preaching, that's what works for me. That's just the way I'm wired. And I'm not the deepest theologian that can delve into theological tough stuff. But sometimes it's the simplest, 
messages can be the most powerful and the ones that we really need to hear. So I'm going to start with a story, and it's something that happened probably five or six years ago, and I can still hear it as clear as if it were this morning. We're approaching the cottage. We're with some friends. My grandkids, the two grandsons are with me. Helen, my wife, was in the cottage still hosting and stuff. And the two boys yell at the top of their lungs as we're a few hundred meters from shore, Grandma, Opa smoked a rock and wrecked our boat. <laughs> and this is mere moments after I had made a deal with them, a pact with them, don't be telling Grandma. I will find a way to let her know in the right time and in the right way. That deal went south in five seconds. You see what had happened, we had, we had a cottage on, on an island in Georgian Bay, and these guests that we had, I wanted to take them for a really interesting trip to Honey Harbor. Now on the boat I got a chart plotter, it's like a GPS, and it shows where all the hazards are, and it also shows the charted course, the safe course that's, that's uh, mapped out by small craft harbors. It's a safe course to get to Honey Harbor. But I had a more interesting one. It would go through all these islands, there's the 30,000 islands, but the 30,000 islands, there's another 30,000 that are just below the surface. Those are the ones you've got to watch out for. Anyways, I thought I had it. And I'm sort of looking at the screen, looking where the boat is and stuff. I, I can make it. But before you know it, wham, I smoked a piece of Canadian shield and it, it did some serious damage. We, didn't, we weren't shipwrecked. It didn't sink or anything, but we were deeply wounded. And we limped it back. And the thing is, it's kind of funny looking back now because my biggest concern was people are going to find out. And I don't want people finding out because it kind of hurts the pride. I took pride in my ability to boat and boat safe and all this stuff. And so often, things in life are compared to a voyage at sea, like that one was. I was following, I should have been following the line, and so often we follow the line, but then there's a little distraction in life, and you get pulled away from that line. Wow, that looks interesting and you get pulled in further and further. And before you know it, you strayed a little too far from that line, distracted by life, and wham. And then through pride, we try to hide it, we deny it, we kind of change the facts a bit, we don't own it. And that's how things happen a lot. But in our scripture reading this morning is also a voyage at sea. And it's also got some great metaphors in it. And as a kid, I always loved those stories because when I hear a story, I always take it very literal. So when I was in uh, English class in high school, I really struggled because when I heard a story, I just took it literally word for word what it meant. And a teacher says, well, what's really meant? I said, well, it says right there. There's that one song by uh, Meatloaf, um, Paradise by the Dashboard Light. I always used to thought it was a song about a baseball game and still thumb and tune me in what it was really about. I go, whew. So I love this story because it was a story of adventure. You know, this big hurricane force winds and is a ship going to go down and it, 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 it saved. But 2 Timothy 4 tells us to use the word or scripture to correct, rebuke, and encourage. And it's really neat because there's so many great metaphors and there's a really good meaning in this story as well. There's a lot more to it. Because often forces of nature beyond our control can come when we least expect it at a, if you're on a voyage at sea. And that happened certainly with this voyage. There are the hazards lo lurking below or this is the weather that comes from above. So on this journey that Paul was on, he was not high in a pecking order. He was a prisoner. So there was a centurion and the captain and the ship's owner. There were the sailors and the soldiers. And then there was Paul and the other sailors, or the other prisoners. And they were at the bottom of the pecking order. They were certainly not in control of decisions made about whether the ship would sail or not, or where it would sail, or what it would do. 
but he was deeply affected by decisions made by others because they were all in on this boat. And then the forces certainly affected them in a major way because the hurricane force wind was battering that ship for many days. And it's not like he didn't try to warn them because before the scripture reading in verse 10 and 11, it says, men, I see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to the ship and cargo and to our own lives also. But the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and the owner of the ship. So they set sail and the nor'easter came and it came hard and they were throwing the cargo overboard and then they throw the tackle overboard. They use anchors to try and control, to try and steer the ship somehow. And then get this in verse 17, they passed ropes. They put ropes like this under the ship to try and hold it together. Now I'm thinking if you got a ship that holds a lot of people in a hurricane force wind and it's starting to fall apart and you're relying on rope to hold it together, <laughs> I'm thinking, man, this isn't going to end very well. But what else did they have? What else did they have? You do the best you can with what you have. And they thought the best they could have was rope. Because they didn't have much faith. You see, Satan was on this journey. And he did not want Paul getting to Rome. Rome was a bustling city of about a million people that really hadn't heard about this new way, this way of Christianity. And Paul being as influential as he was, Satan did not want Paul to start spreading that in Rome. He had to keep him from getting to Rome. Before they set sail to Rome, they tried to, there was an ambush plan, but that got discovered and they worked around that. The centurion really wanted him to get to Rome. So when they left, it, needed to, it either needed to be shipwrecked or he needed to be killed or thrown overboard or something. He could not get to Rome. Verse 42 and 43, the soldiers planned to kill the prisoners to prevent any of them from swimming away and escaping. But the centurion wanted to spare Paul's life and kept them from carrying out their plan. You see, the centurion was, they were a very high-ranking Roman officer. And he had come to realize there's something different about this Paul fella. I need to get him to Rome. And I better listen to him a little bit. He figured he'd be a wiser man and better served if he paid heed to what Paul said. Not just in his mind, but believe it. Believe it deeply in his heart. See, a little earlier on, the sailors, knowing they were approaching land, and they figured this thing is going to get obliterated because we're putting our trust in this rope. But they had lifeboats, perfectly good lifeboats. So they were lowering the lifeboats and jumping the lifeboats with the top of the packing order. But Paul said to the centurion, unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. So the soldiers cut the ropes that held the lifeboat and let it drift away. So to be clear, we have the ship held together by rope, but you got perfectly good lifeboats. And a centurion puts his faith in Paul's God and says, let those lifeboats go. We're going to trust in Paul's God. Do we have faith like that? Because so often it's like that in life. We think we know the best. We have a plan. We can figure it out on our own. Instead of listening to God. I've served a number of times in our own, uh, in our own church's council and stuff. And I have to admit, it happens quite often that during the opening prayer, when you ask that the meeting be led by the Holy Spirit, I sort of hear the prayer, but my mind is already thinking, we've got these problems we've got to figure out, but I've got a plan. I've got a plan. And how often doesn't it happen that we have a plan that will solve the problem, instead of really trusting the Holy Spirit to speak to us? 
And it's hard. It is really hard to do that. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. See, Paul was probably the greatest evangelist ever and Satan was throwing everything he had at him to try and stop him from getting to Rome. Because Paul was just simply following the Great Commission to share the news, to share the greatest love story ever. In a couple of weeks, Pastor Casey will be starting his ministry here, and I know uh, Water Street Church has had a real focus on becoming the irresistible church. There's a lot of excitement, there's a lot of enthusiasm, You've, you're turning the page, looking for the post-COVID, this nice expansion and renovation you've had, you can finally put it to use because you were in it for a couple of months before COVID hit. But there's a, there's a really good feeling here. That's my understanding. It, it, it's exciting. The new chapter of ministering to each other and to the community out there is about to start to minister to those that don't know Christ. You want to tell others about Jesus, about how he died for us so that we can live life eternal in heaven and that we can be saved. But make no mistake, Satan doesn't want you out there. If you're in here, he'll sort of concede that, but he doesn't want you talking to people that are in his court. He doesn't want this church to be irresistible. He wants you to stay resistible. In baseball, if you have a runner on third with nobody out, if you watch like the Jays or something, the defense will often play back to double play depth. They'll concede the runner at third. That's what they always say. We'll concede the runner at third. They'll let that runner score because he probably will with nobody out yet. And we'll go for the double play. We'll make sure the others don't get on base and start their way around to, to get to home. And sometimes it's like that with Satan too. He'll concede the believers that are here. Not that he doesn't try and tempt us. He doesn't want us messing with the people out there. Not only does he want to shipwreck our lives, he wants to shipwreck the church, especially if it's an effective church. He wants us to put our trust in a rope on our own plans and stuff instead of listening to God through prayer. He doesn't want us out there preaching God's grace. He doesn't want us preaching about Christmas or Easter. He wants Christmas to be about, well, out there it sort of is about the holiday season, the holiday tree, happy holidays. He wants to take Christ out of Christmas. And Easter, he wants it to be all about the Easter bunny and chocolate eggs and egg hunts. And I'm not saying you can't have an Easter egg hunt. They're a lot of fun for kids and stuff. But don't lose the meaning of Easter. In our story this morning, our scripture reading, Paul survived his journey to Rome. And as Christians, we will survive our journey through life because we belong to God. And we'll survive this life here and we will be promoted into eternal life. And why? Because the war has been won. The war was won on the cross. But the battles will rage on until Christ returns. And in that meantime, we want to tell others that good news. And then we've got to realize, how do we tell others that good news? I mean, you can go knocking on doors and, you know, have your line or something. Or you can live it so people see it. The centurion saw there was something different about Paul. I have a niece that got married just under a year ago. I didn't, I, don't really, I didn't really know her husband well at all, and then when we were Cooper camping just a couple of weeks ago, um, they came down too, and I was talking to him for a bit, and I soon got to know that he did not grow up as a Christian. He did not grow up in a Christian family, and none of his family are Christian. So I sort of, 
I asked him how he, be, how he had come to become a Christian and gave his life to Christ. And he said, you know, it's really interesting because after going to university, when he had his first job, he said, I, I worked in an office and there were a couple of people there that I noticed they were different. They had this peace about them that I envied. It wasn't something that money could buy. I had no idea why they, why they were the way they were, but it was very different. I had never seen that before. So after watching this for a number of weeks, he confronted them. He says, there's something different about you guys. You guys don't get anxious about stuff. You guys just have this joy in you. And then they shared the good news of the gospel with them. But that was speaking by actions. That was speaking by actions. Would the people that work with you, would they know you're a Christian by the way you live? Do you show that joy knowing that when life on earth is done, you'll have eternal life in heaven? That you belong to God? But however we choose to share the story that we know, never underestimate the power of Satan. Because he wants us to put our trust in the rope and not in God, not in the Holy Spirit, not in prayer. On our own, we can't beat Satan. We are powerless to Satan because he is incredibly powerful. We need to rely on the Holy Spirit for protection because we know God is more powerful and he will protect us. But that comes through prayer and the importance of prayer can never be underscored enough. But you know, that's, that's difficult. I think everyone here would, would agree with me when you say that prayer is so important, personally, in your family, and in the life of the church. We know it up here, but do we believe it in here? I know in Acton, 10 or 15 years ago, we really ramped up a prayer ministry, and it really worked well. It, it, it resulted in great things in our church. But in recent years, that has slipped, and you can tell. And what happens, it gives a door for Satan to come in, and, and, and we're dealing with certain things that we shouldn't be dealing with as a church in leadership, in staffing, just different things. But it's so hard to have the faith, and so often people will really beat themselves up when they say, I want to believe in prayer, but I just, I struggle with that. But don't beat yourself up too bad. There's a story in Acts 12, when Peter was imprisoned, and a whole bunch of his followers and his disciples and friends were at the house of Mary praying for his release. They were praying for his release, that he would be released from jail. And that's indeed what happened. In the middle of the night, an angel came and the locks just fell off the doors, the chains fell off his hands, and as they walked through one gate after another, they just swung open, the angel let him out, and then he walked to Mary's house, knocks at the door, the servant girl Rhoda answers, there's Peter, wow. She runs in and tells the people, Peter's out there. They're going, you're nuts, he's in jail. All the time they're praying that he's released. So did they really believe in the power of prayer? They probably struggled with it too. Everybody struggles with it. So that's what we need to work on. Our faith in the power of prayer and prayer ministry. Because again, we all believe it in here. In Acton 2, we have prayer groups and stuff that, that pray Sunday mornings and we'll have like three or four people show up. Do we as a church believe in the power of prayer? Because that has to lead us through. In 1742, there was a guy by the name of Thomas Gray and he wrote a poem that included this line. Where ignorance is bliss, 
tis folly to be wise. And through the, through the years, it's just being shortened up to ignorance is bliss. In other words, we're not knowing what is what you want. If you don't want to know, it's foolish to educate yourself. It's foolish to get to know. But it's so true, isn't it? How many times haven't you heard of people that they simply don't want to go to the doctor because they're scared of what they'll find out? They don't want to know because they're scared of the truth. So they live in ignorance because it's bliss. If they don't know, life is bliss. Life is happy. Some people don't want to watch the news. They know there's unrest over with Russia and the Ukraine. There's a lot of other civil unrest all around the globe. I'm not watching news. It just gets me down. I'd rather just live happy here in Canada. And I get that. I, I get why people think that. But then it happens in the realms of our own mortality quite often too. But more important to the people that are out there they don't want to know about their own mortality. What happens when they die? They don't want to think about it. It scares them. We've been without a pastor for a couple of years in Acton, and about a year ago, a young man in his 40s, very fit, very healthy, died overnight of a massive heart attack. He'd been a lifelong member of our church. I was his cadet counselor when he was in cadets and stuff. He wasn't really big on church attendance. You'd see it from time to time, but he was a solid Christian fella. So he had social circles that were largely outside of the church community. So they asked me to officiate the funeral, and it provides a great opportunity because there were a lot of people of his age, in their 40s and stuff, in, in you know, the middle of their life, so to speak, that didn't want to think about their own mortality, but they were brought to it because lying at the front is Shane. And they kind of think, where is Shane? I see his body here, but where is Shane? And they honestly believe that if there is a God, and if there is a heaven and hell, the things I've done are too bad. They are beyond forgiveness. So they are grossly misinformed. Because if there is a God, he ain't going to like me. Man, the things I've done. So they stick their heads in the sand. They don't want to think about it. Ignorance is bliss. And Satan loves it when they do that. But we know different. We know different. Because it's really quite simple. Because it's not about what we did or what we didn't do. Not at all. Because when humanity fell into sin, we separated ourselves from God, but he loves us so much that he created the perfect rescue plan that regardless of what we've done, we can be saved and have eternal life in heaven. And that is God's grace. And that is a message that Satan does not want us getting out there. He knows we all know it here. He'll concede the runner at third. Just don't mess with his people out there. So he attacks the church. And that comes in many different forms. It can be... Um, through families, it can be marriage separations, it just doesn't look good, it, but more, oftentimes it can also come with disputes that come within the church, where there's friction going on. People that, from the community that come to this church, they sense that and say, whoa, I'm not sure I want to belong to a church like this. There's been some churches that have been very, very powerful. The meeting house in Oakville, Roxy Cavey's church, he was recently asked to resign and he got charged with sexual assault or something. But, and within our own classes too, we've had chaplains, we've had youth pastors that, that have to resign. They get out of the ministry for reasons similar. And so often we, I, I hear people saying, how can, 
How could they do that? How could they let that happen? But before you say things like that, you've got to realize that Satan has been hammering on them. And Satan is powerful. So we need to seek protection from the Holy Spirit to build that hedge of protection around us. And if you're not effective, if you're not doing much, I don't want to say Satan doesn't attack you, but for those that are powerful and that are the movers and shakers, they need to have a wall of protection. They need prayer support around them. And that comes through a strong prayer ministry. One very powerful evangelist that knew this very well was Billy Graham. He never had any kind of controversy surrounding him. But what a lot of people don't know is that with all of his crusades, and I grew up watching those crusades on TV, that was years ago, but with all of his crusades, there were literally thousands of intercessory prayers that would pray around the clock for him for spiritual protection because they knew that the attacks of Satan would come, but they also knew that our God is a more powerful God. And that protection can be had, but it's got to be prayed for. And that should be the mission of this church. When you want to become the irresistible church, you have to have a strong prayer ministry to protect those that are going out, to protect the ministries that are out there, because Satan is going to take notice that, man, that Water Street Church, they're grabbing some of my people. And he will attack. But the good news is that God is more powerful, but we've got to go to God to seek that power. It's almost 11 o'clock. I just got one more story here. Because when Satan attacks, we need to recognize it. We need to identify it and say, sorry, Satan, not in here. This is God's house. I don't know if we got people here that are NBA fans, but in the 90s and the early 2000s, there was a player, seven foot two, this ginormous guy from Africa, Dikembe Mutombo. He was one of the best shot blockers the NBA has ever seen. Very powerful guy, tall obviously and strong, and he played against the greats like Michael Jordan, Scottie Pippen, Shaq and stuff. And he was the one that guy that could jump higher than their shot at the basket and just swat a thing out. And his famous move was the finger wag. No, 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 no. Not in my house. I see some nods here. No, 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 no. Not in my house. Because the key, the area in front of the net, that was his house. And this is God's house. And if Satan comes knocking here, and it can be in your ministry board, your executive community, your council, your staff, when things start happening that you know aren't God's will, you got to identify it, and rather than start clashing, you got to say, no, 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 not in our house. This is God's house, and Satan has no room here. And it's hard to do that because it'll take humility to back down and say, you know what, maybe my point of view wasn't totally right. We are God's people. We have to work at this mission together. And that is not easy because pride is the deadliest of seven deadly sins. And Satan wants us all to be proud. I'm right, they're wrong. And once you dig in, it's hard. It's hard to back down and say, you know what? Maybe I spoke too soon. But if Water Street Church wants to be an irresistible church out there, we need to rely on the power of the Spirit and we need to pray for that spiritual protection. And the good news is that God is more powerful. So we don't need to rely on rope, our own minds, what we think is best, but we rely on the guiding of the Holy Spirit and the wall of protection that he can give us. Amen.
Please stand. One more quick story. <laughs> I remember very clearly the first time I saw my mother cry. And I was devastated. Because like, women back then, nowadays women cry all the time. <laughs> back then they didn't. But it was after church and she had heard one of those fire and brimstone sermons. But it was like the second half the sermon was missing because it was all about our depravity and God's grace was not preached. God's grace is central to the gospel message. So as a preacher, I make sure when I look back at, at what I was led to put down on paper, Am I preaching God's grace? That's how important it is. She felt like she was drowning in a sea, unable to reach the surface. I remember her saying that. In 1912, probably saw the greatest shipwreck ever, that of the, of the Titanic. I guess they didn't have a rope to hold it together. I don't, I don't know. But two thirds of the 2200 Passengers lost their lives, and they made quite a powerful movie years after that. It's quite a while ago, but I remember the movie well. And at the end of the movie, as the movie is like right at the very end, the Carpathia, the rescue ship, is sailing off way in the distance. You can hardly see it no more. And there's a girl, a young lady, clinging onto a piece of wreckage, or maybe, maybe it was a piece of rope that she was clinging on for hope crying out in her feeble voice, come back, come back. The ship obviously didn't come back and she perished like so many others. And that's how it can be in life when we are living in troubled seas, when we reach out for the rope or our other things in life 
the world doesn't hear us. But regardless of how close we feel to drowning on our own troubled sea, if you cry, come back to God, he will come back. He will always come back, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've done. And he will see us safe to shore on the other side. And at the end of this worship celebration, God sends us on our way. And as we leave this place, we pray that God go before us to lead us, that God go behind us to protect us, and God go beneath us to support us, and he go beside us to befriend us, and do not be afraid. And as we receive the blessing, I always hold my hands out to receive something he's giving to me. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. Amen.